the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Let the gate of heaven open today. For the Father's beginning, lest Logos, having taken a beginning in time, and not separated from His divinity, is willingly offered as a 40-day-old infant in the temple of the law by His virgin mother. And the elder receives Him in His arms. Let me depart, cries the servant of the Master, for my eyes have seen Your salvation, O Lord, who came to the world to save the human race. Glory to you. I was blessed to visit, to visit yesterday one of our beloved parishioners, Nick, who's at the age of 99. And at the hospital, he confessed to me, Father, life is so short. <laughs> and I said, yes, Nick, it's very short, especially if you compare yourself to, to Simeon. There's another person of ours at the hospital. They're both expecting death. And we've had death in our families. My parents, most of yours as well. Beloved ones. And when they're suffering, there's a sense of need to end that. And after one gives his soul... Many times we are tempted to say, or we even say, it is finished. With some sort of gratitude. And God had mercy on that person. And shortened the, the suffering maybe. It is finished. Elder Simeon today didn't look for a finish. Elder Simeon today comes together with us to receive the Lord, to receive life. In peace. Not to look for a finish, but for a fulfillment. The great feast today, a royal feast for us. At the beginning, before Lent starts actually, points to another event during the Holy Week. Depicted in that icon right there. The crucifixion of the Lord. Yet another man awaiting for his death. But when he was up on the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ said, Teteleste, which in most of the Bibles that you find in this country are translated as, it is finished. But let us not be fooled. It is not about being finished. It's about what this word means in Greek. It is fulfilled. It is all completed. It's what Christ did for us. Something that we cannot do. Completed the work of salvation of mankind and of all creation. That no creature can do. Those who come to the catechism class had to listen and read certain things. And in one of them, there was a point there saying, you don't know what Christ did for you to bring life unless you realize that you're dead. You don't See the, the light until you realize that you're in the darkness. And you don't get the good news of the gospel until you see the bad news. So today we have great good news here. In this very icon, pointing to the cross, to the fulfillment of what God had in mind. The great news. And my message to you today is that in order to participate this in a mystical way as in a mystery... We must be prepared. Elder Simeon, I came here close to the icon so, you could, so I can explain some things to you. This is so, so much happening today. So much happening. I don't mean Father Mark being here and so on. But what happens is the whole world of the Old Testament comes in a beam focused, focused on this man right here, Simeon. The poor man didn't know what he signed up for. Here's his story, quickly. About 280 years before the time of Christ, the Jews around the Mediterranean area would not, were not able to understand their language, the Hebrew language. So those in Alexandria in Egypt sent word to Jerusalem and asked for help to translate the Bible, the Old Testament for us, their Bible, 
from the Hebrew language into the Greek, which was the spoken language then. Seventy wise men were sent to Alexandria, and quickly, diligently, they translated the Bible into the Greek version, which is known today to be the Septuagint, briefly abbreviated as LXX in text, the Septuagint. There were 70 elders. In the process of translating and checking, one of them who was responsible for the book of Isaiah had problems with the way verse 7, uh, uh, chapter 7, verse 14 was translated there. Because he found the manuscript, the translation, the translation from another elder for him to check that said that a virgin should take in her womb and give birth to a son, Emmanuel. And he erased that word virgin and he said a young woman should take in the womb. And then the next day he woke up, checked the work again and he found a change, says a virgin. And he erased it again and he wrote down a young woman. And this happened three times. And the third time, the archangel appeared to him and told him, Simeon, because this was his name. Because you don't really read the, the will of God properly. This is, what, this is your penance, your canon. You will not die until you see this happening. The virgin giving birth to Messiah Emmanuel. And they are, typically when archangels come to tell us things like this, they really mean it. And he meant it. So by the time Jesus came, um, was born, this man must have been now over 300 years. And he lived in Jerusalem. And now, great mystery. Huge mystery. We learn from the gospel lesson today that this man, by now old, older than our friend Nick, was righteous, devout, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. These are three conditions that are important to us, St. John the Baptist community. Thinking of the four pillars of healthy lives, of healthy parish. Righteous, devout, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it is this Holy Spirit that brought him, revealed to him, as the Gospel says, that you, he was not to see death before seeing the Messiah coming from the Virgin. The same Holy Spirit inspired Simeon to go to the temple exactly 40 days after the birth of Jesus Christ when his parents, according to the law given by God, bring the Son of God to obey to that very law, to the temple. The law had to do with their exodus from, of the Jewish people from, from Egypt. To do this in remembrance of the goodness of God and what God has done to save them. And they brought the baby. And to redeem him, to take him back from the temple, they pay the price of a poor family to the temple. Two turtle doves or two pigeons, as you see them here. Expressing purity. They couldn't afford the lamb. So Elder Simeon here fulfills, fulfills in him, in count meeting the Son of God, baby Jesus Christ at the temple. He fulfills the promise of God to all the people before him, many generations, to the prophets, to the kings, to the priests. Finally, what they had seen as in a veil, what they could not touch as Moses on Mount Sinai, and the rest, he now sees. Now he can see this. And as he says this, he calls for his departure. But this is not any departure. This is not an ending. Lord, now let your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. Your word is fulfilled now. I am fulfilled. Done. Fulfillment. No fear. Peace. No fear. Peace. Because of the Holy Spirit upon him, and because the elder was righteous and devout, he prophesied. So not only did he make possible the mystery 
of God to be revealed and proclaimed at the temple. But now he brings to life another mystery, the mystery of the Virgin Mary. For where there is Christ and his mystery, we cannot separate him from the, vis- the mystery of the Theotokos. The church has never done so. They always come together. That's why Simeon immediately turns to the mother of the baby, of, of Jesus, saying, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising of many in Israel. We see right at the cross, right there. The one on the right for his rising. The one on the left for his fall. The ones who follow him for their rising. The ones who come away from him for their fall. And for a sign that is spoken against, fought. What is the sign? The Holy Father say his very birth, because Herod tried to kill him right away. And the other one, the sign is the sign of the cross. That people to this day speak against fighting it. The mystery of the Virgin Mary is completed by what the, what the elder prophesies here. Telling her that her soul will be pierced by a sword. What does it mean? A lot of pain. And again, the Holy Fathers in our hymns today, that we heard beautiful, magnificent celebration we, we had at Orthros and last night at Vespers, they say this piercing of the soul of the Virgin Mary is the very cross. It is the very cross. The third mystery of what we have in front of us right here, pointing to the mystery of the cross, the Son of God being revealed, fulfilling everything. The Virgin Mary is the mystery through whom Christ became man, took flesh, and also the mystery of the cross that is given to all that their hearts will be revealed. Whose hearts? Yours and mine in the presence of the cross, in the presence of the sacrifice. It is amazing that there is also a woman there, Anna, who is also called a prophetess, who was there for many, many years. She was a widow. And what did she do? She gave thanks to God and spoke of Him. So we see here Elder Simeon waiting for a long time, not for his end, but for a fulfillment. And we see Him here revealing the mysteries of Christ, of God. Yet, there's another one that is not present in the Gospel. It is between the lines. But our beautiful church has proclaimed it and taught it by means of iconography. This amazing icon here Tells us something about how the baby was transferred from his mother to the elder Simeon. You see the elder here kind of hunched over. Not the temple is depicted as the church. The temple is depicted as a church. We see the royal doors, which we don't have in our little setup here, but every Orthodox church properly set up, has the the royal doors. And inside of the altar, we see the altar table, the table of sacrifice. And what's on that table? Can you see? The book that I read from, indeed. The gospel, the word of God. The word of God. Isn't this amazing? Not, Not completely. Listen to this. Where's the baby? Right above the sacrificial table. Who is brought to the temple for the sacrificial table? The lamb. The animals. The animals. So here's another mystery of this beautiful feast day. The mystery of the Eucharist. The sacrificial lamb. The son of God himself. The unblemished one who shed his blood. Sheds his blood for us. It's an image of the Eucharist right here. And the Virgin Mary in a mystical way going towards the cross to suffer to make this possible. What a beautiful day this was for Elder Simeon, wasn't it? 
But why was this? We're about to partake, you are about to partake of Holy Communion, to be part of this mystery. As we gather many times, thank God, in the beautiful church, we are precisely in this situation, in front of the altar of the Holy Table. But note here that only to Simeon and Anna, this mystery was revealed. Because they were prepared. They were prepared. Simeon waited for the fulfillment of his life. But brothers and sisters, not all wait is salvific. As we say we wait doing certain things, that state of wait might not take us to this point of participation in the mysteries. And there are quite a few that happen in the church today. The elder and Anna teach us that this participation in the mystery that will change the end of life into fulfilling is by means of preparation. This is what the man did. He was righteous, devout, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Isn't this the call of all of us, the Orthodox Christians? To purify our hearts, to have them illumined and to be deified by the Holy Spirit. You might say, yes, Father, but he had 380 years at his disposal to prepare. Well, we too have to prepare. And as many years as the good Lord will give us, we should thank him. Not because we do everything worthwhile to complete what's needed for our salvation, because he did that on the cross. But because in repentance and in preparation, we receive life over death. Light over darkness. Peace over stress. So because we just finished the book together, a magnificent book as a group. And I think I mentioned to you this before, how I wished you could take an hour and a half every week to attend these gatherings of the book forum. How much you would benefit and how much all of us in the community would benefit. This book was called The Gurus, The Young Men, and The and Elder Paisios. It's a man who was lost, completely lost into spiritual questioning and finding in the world, who by the prayers of St. Paisios now, was saved from great danger. Well, when he came to his senses, he realized, pretty much saying, man, this is the church. Now look what the church has to offer. Nothing found like this in India with the gurus, with the yogis and all the prayers and they do there. This is the real thing. And he grew to be on a position to be by the, by the elder Paisios. And then he questioned the power of the mysteries, primarily of the Holy Eucharist, which is what we see in the icon here we're about to partake. Questioning that in the sense of who distributes it and who prays for it. In other words, of the priest. And he said, on Mount Athos here, you are holy people. You receive the sacraments because you are men, you know, like Elder Simeon pretty much. But when I go back to Thessaloniki, to the parish there, the priest who does, you know, the service every Sunday, is that really the true Eucharist? How can that be? And because of the prayers of his spiritual father, the answer came, not through the mouth, but by doing. The man tells us that he prepared for Holy Communion in the city parish. He did confession. He prayed the prayers before communion, the evening before with great diligence. He fasted. And when he approached the Holy Communion, what did the hymn say? The gate of heaven opened upon him. The grace of God was so overwhelming that he felt bursting to fill up the world. And the joy that cannot be described, the presence of God. Being in the presence of God in the uncreated light. So he shared this with us. And we all kind of reflected. And I was asked, Father, how about us? It's the same question that he asked here. Does this happen to us? Of course. So I'll quote to you in the ending of my, my homily today, a little paragraph from this book about 
how we are to approach Holy Communion. In an attempt to give an answer by what I mean when the Holy Chalice is brought out with the fear of God and fear approach God, the Holy Communion is for those Orthodox Christians who are in good standing who have prepared. This is what I mean. Quote, in order for Christ to act within the divine mysteries, the communicant has to will to participate in the mystery consciously. He must yearn from it. He must desire that. And he is required to prepare for it with personal struggle. Elder Simeon, personal struggle. This is why those who nonchalantly approach the mysteries out of habit experience, very little change. Very little change. If they experience anything at all. When, however, a person manifests his desire for God and his assent to being united with Him by taking pains to repent sincerely, God in turn will approach the genuinely repentant one to the extent and degree that He, God, knows will be beneficial for that person's soul. What a great benefit preparation brings. That God will give us according to what He thinks is beneficial to us. Not to according to what we think is beneficial to us. The importance of conscience participation in the mysteries of Christ can be seen in the elder Paisios, Saint Paisio's response to a man who foolishly boasted about communing frequently, as it happens in countries like Greece and Romania at times, and maybe here too. The deluded fellow pridefully thought that he had become holy because he would commune two or three times a week. The elder told him, Look here, it's not so important how often you commune. What's most important is how you prepare yourself. And then afterwards, how much you tend to Christ who is living inside you. So, with the fear of God, faith and love, we draw near. How humble the Lord is to offer Himself in the hands of the elder to fulfill the promise. And how humble He is to allow Himself to be broken on the altar table, both in this meeting and in our meeting today. And how wise is our church reminding us that without proper preparation, there's no fulfillment, but an end. And I challenge you, my spiritual children, Lent is upon us. Let us do better. This is why it's given, to change. Let us be willing to take this effort and uh, grow a little bit because where, where the Spirit of God is in our repentance, much fruit will be produced in our own lives and the life of our community. Indeed, the fruits will come according to the will of God, whom we glorify today, the one who willingly condescended, was born from the Virgin Mary, given to the temple to be held in the arms of the elder Simeon, redeemed from himself by, with the price of two pigeons, to be given to us today in the Holy Chalice. Amen.